Hi there, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Horn Call podcast. This is James Bolden. I'm the publications editor for the International Horn Society and your host. I always say I'm excited about my guests on the podcast, and I truly am, but I'm even more excited for my guest today, Leelani Sterrett, a member of the New York Philharmonic's horn section and a friend of mine that goes way back to my uh, days at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. I kind of wax a little bit poetic about it at the beginning of the podcast, but you'll have to humor me there for a little bit. It's really fun to reminisce with uh, someone I knew way back when, and uh, it's so exciting to see friends and colleagues go on and do all the amazing Amazing things that they're doing, and uh, Leelani is certainly a prime example of that. She's just a fantastic horn player, musician, and just an all-around good human being. So I really hope you enjoy my conversation with Leelani Sterrett. Awesome. All right, Leelani, thank you so much for chatting with me today. Um, I have to say, so going way back to when I first met you, um, I can't remember what year it was, maybe like, when did you start at the University of Wisconsin? What year did you start? I think it was um, 2004. Okay, 2004. Mm -hmm. So, freshman you, and I think you played on like maybe the first studio class or something. And like from the moment you played, it was like, okay, this person is, they're going to be a horn player. And there was something about just your confidence on stage. And I mean, it wasn't no perfect by any means. None of us, none of us are. And it wasn't like you didn't sound the way you sound now, of course, because you had a lot of work to do like we all do. But there was just something about like, wow. Okay, this person is, they're going to do it. Whatever oh. <laughs> that is, whatever it is they want to do, they're going to do it. So I'm so stoked to talk to you today. And it's so cool to be like, hey, I knew that person way back when. So <laughs> I told <laughs> oh, you I would really do nice that before we say. went on mic. Yeah. <laughs> that's right. Thanks, James. Yeah. No, it's, it's, it, yeah, I'm, I'm really happy to, to have this talk. And yeah, I came to Wisconsin just, just, I was such a, like an eager beaver, I guess, you know, um, but I, you know, I have to say too, like that was a really special time. Um, I know I'm kind of getting ahead of myself maybe, but I, I feel like coming into UW when I did was, it was just kind of like a, a peak time and you were in the studio and so many great grad students, undergrads. Um, it was such an incredible community that I came into. Um, it was just the perfect place to be at that moment for, you know, 18 year old me just, wanting to be a sponge and soak it all up. Actually, one of my very first and, and sort of most indelible University of Wisconsin memories is a concert that you and Matt Beecher did, who was another DMA student at the time. But I think you played Strauss one and he played the Britain Serenade. And That's you each right. conducted for each other and led the orchestra. And I don't know, I'll never forget that concert. It was the first time oh, I'd well, heard the Britain. Yeah. And it was just like, it, I knew I was in the right place <laughs> at that moment because that was going on all, all within our studio. It was just, you both played so impressively. And I was just there in the audience, you know, as, as a freshman, like, oh my God, I've got to do this. I'm going <laughs> to, this has got to be my life. So, yeah. Well, thanks. No, it's, yeah, it's, uh, you know, everybody's got their, special experiences somewhere. But yeah, it's, it's, I tell my students now when they're maybe like complaining about something they're not particularly interested in doing or like, oh, why do I have to do this? I'm like, trust me, take it all in. It's grist for the mill. 20 years from now, you're going to look back on it and it's, it's all going to be good. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and you have no way of knowing what the experiences you have right now, how they're going to affect you and, you know, the connections you make and the networking that you do. So yeah, it's, you had mm -hmm. the absolute right approach, which brings me to my next point. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you show up there, but you had come from Interlochen. Mm -hmm. And so tell me a little bit about how that got started. And obviously, any, well, anybody that doesn't know Interlochen is, there's two parts, right? There's the year round school, which is like the academy. And then there's the summer program. Mm -hmm. If I'm That's not right. mistaken, okay, I yeah. may have mm -hmm. I may have the terminology not quite right, but I know there's the summer the summer part where you can just go and do the summer, but then you were in the like year round basically that was like your high school. Yes, yeah, I did my last two years of high school at the academy, uh, so junior and senior year. Um, I grew up in in the same neck of the woods as Interlock in northern Michigan, and. Okay. 
my family was really musically enthusiastic. My mom is an amateur flute player, so my earliest musical memories are going to her summer band concerts, sitting out in the lawn with my friends and doing cartwheels and <laughs> hearing the music. And um, and she was just a great example in terms of somebody who had played music all through her youth, through high school, not pursued it professionally, but kept it a part of her life. Mm -hmm. um, so she was one of the main sort of influences in my life early on. It was sort of on uh, her call that my siblings and I would all at least try an instrument when we were old enough to be in, in band. And I think uh, I went through a couple miserable years of piano lessons that just didn't, <laughs> <laughs> uh, didn't gel with me so much. Um, but we always had the radio playing at home. We had a great local public radio station, which was also affiliated with Interlochen. So that was, you know, all the all the NPR classics, but also just great classical music. We had a really good radio DJ, uh, many of them. <laughs> so um, I grew up, you know, singing show tunes with my grandma and just kind of being surrounded by music as, as the norm and, and processing maybe a lot of classical music without really knowing what I was hearing or really right, having right. any particular affinity. Um, and I, I started playing the horn in, in my middle school band, fifth grade, just kind of, you know, normal. I wanted to play the saxophone. My mom being a woodwind player, she really didn't want like a loud reed instrument in the house, but she didn't have too much experience with brass instruments, so I don't know what's better. The, you know, the fact that horn players have a really hard time hitting that first starting note until, I don't know, what, six or seven years into right, <laughs> studying right. the horn, you know, there's a lot of trade-offs, but I, I started on horn and I, I just... I liked it. You know, I, I wasn't like a kid who practiced all the time, but I love the challenge of it. Um, I went to a couple summer programs, really loved it. Um, so my sort of luckiest moment was, was being so close to Interlock and I was able to start taking lessons in eighth grade. I had an incredible teacher, Julie Schleif. Um, mm -hmm. So I started with her in eighth grade. After three years together, um, I was from a really small public school and I was sort of out of extracurricular options and right. th things like that. And and so she very, very sort of diplomatically said, well, have you thought about Interlochen? And I had done a couple summers as a camper there and I thought, well, Interlochen, I can't get into that. You know, <laughs> I can't go there. And she said, why don't you just apply and we'll see. And, um, and you know, I ended up getting in and I ended up doing my last two years of, of high school there. Um, which was great because I was a super curious kid and I loved music, but I didn't know the first thing about what you would do to become a musician professionally. So uh, Interlochen was so instrumental in teaching me kind of what what the path was if you were mm -hmm. interested in that. But um, really, it was it was Julie's influence more than than anything else. Um, she was just a great mentor, but she was really, as, as a teacher, she just made sure I had the right start and had great fundamentals and had an understanding of how to work on a piece of music and how important it was to be able to define your musical terminology, how important it was when you're working on, you know, we barely even did Coprosh, that so was a little bit to, you know, we did a lot of like Concone studies, things right. like that. Um, other etudes, uh, Maxime Alphonse, like book one, you know, sure. and the importance of having a musical plan for every measure that you went through, having your metronome marking defined by the time you walk into that lesson. And just being in control of everything that you could be musically. And just because you know, you're 14 or 15 years old, it doesn't mean that you can't hold yourself to the same standard that will ultimately apply as a college musician or even a professional musician. So I'm very grateful um, for that sort of early exposure to a sort of um, uh, methodical way to do things and, and um, it's really sort of push to to open my ears to a lot of things and learn how to listen to recordings mm -hmm. and how to seek out new music, things like that. So yeah, so I, I you know, and I when I went off to college, I mean, I I was definitely going to go to a state school. I had all these ideas of double majoring and doing mm -hmm. all these things. I was kind of an ambitious kid, but I met um, Douglas Hill at the University of Wisconsin at my audition there, and that was kind of um, the end of the story. Is <laughs> I mean, you know, it, it was it was so clearly the the right place um, for me to be with with him. So I went there for um, four great years. Along the way, I would say as I was coming up, I, I played in some youth orchestras and doing summer programs, and of course Interlock. And I got bit by the orchestra bug hard at some right. point. And for me, 
as a horn player, that's always been just the number one thing I wanted to do. Yeah, I just, I, I, I knew, I knew from my first experiences in playing in summer camp orchestras, playing in youth orchestra, playing in high school orchestra, that that's what I wanted to do. I just love being an orchestral player. Um, so yeah. that was sort of guiding my steps all along the way. Yeah. That's awesome. So I have to ask, and be, being a parent, I have a 10 year old son and being a college professor in this day and age with sort of the trajectory and the demographics of higher education, almost always the parents are concerned when their child wants to be in any kind of like arts field or music or anything like that. And, you know, it's, it's laughable for me to mention like what it was like when I was looking at colleges because it was so long ago. But I remember my parents, if they had any concerns, they were very careful not to let me know. They were just kind of like, okay, you, you do it and you go as hard at it as you possibly can and you give it everything and we'll support you no matter what. I, uh, was it that way for you? Did your parents express any sort of concerns? No, they didn't, you know, um, and I'm grateful. I'm grateful that they, that they didn't. Um, I think it was like, you know, well, we'll send her off to college and, and, you know, see what happens. You know, she's, uh, I don't know, at a state school and getting a, a good, well-rounded education. And, and, um, there was never any sort of, any sort of doubt or questioning, like, are, are you sure? Um, I'm not sure why that was, if that was sort of, if they were maybe, um, protecting me or if they were showing their support that way or if they just didn't really know what the what the odds were or, or anything like that but they've always been supportive and of course you know my mom like probably everybody's mom every time I'd be going to an audition and she'd say I know that you're I know you're gonna win this one sweetie you know <laughs> <laughs> I say no and I think you gotta stop saying that mom you know? yeah I've There's had that happen a, yeah <laughs> your parents are like well, why can't you get a job in town right. and like, well, yeah, right. Mm-hmm. How many reasons do you want me to list? You know, <laughs> right. But. but she had ultimate, ultimate faith, and 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 every every time I went off and and you know tried for a festival or grad school mm-hmm. auditions jobs, you know, it was always I know I know you're gonna get it, and just kind of it did project this sort of total confidence though that you're gonna do it. Like mm-hmm. I know I know you're gonna do it, and and I actually have a, a younger sister now too who's a professional musician, so oh, really? we were not not dissuaded. Yeah, she's a she's a singer. She's eight years younger than me. And, okay. Yeah. So, and, and singing professionally. So, that's yeah. Awesome. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. That's really cool. Mm-hmm. Um, so, at, I assume if, if you're like a lot of folks, you kind of have this idea when you start college of, well, I love playing the horn. I'm pretty good at it. I've gotten, you know, uh, accolades or whatever along the way that sort of build up one's, you know, confidence to try, try this thing. And then at a, at a certain point, you start to narrow your focus a little bit like, well, this seems to be the area I want to focus my attention. Did you, did you always know, okay, I want to play professionally in an orchestra? Or at what point did, did you kind of come to that decision? I kind of, I kind of always knew that mm-hmm. was, that was the number one for me. Mm-hmm. Um, I love chamber music. I, enjoy giving recitals although you know being a soloist is not not really a feasible career path for a <laughs> for a horn player nor nor am I cut up for that in the slightest um but and and um you know and even when I was in grad school maybe teaching seemed a sort of um uh it seemed very abstract to me mm. um that that sort of uh that that part of professional life um but orchestra just kind of captured my imagination and mm-hmm. I was so hungry for it. I mean, I, I loved taking auditions. I didn't love actually being playing the auditions, being <laughs> on stage. I mean, you know, extraordinarily stressful, nerve wracking, all of it. But I knew that that was what you had to do. Mm-hmm. Um, so I took a lot of auditions and I actually started auditioning when I was still in Wisconsin during my undergrad. Mm-hmm. And as you know, one of the amazing things about that area of the country is just how many little regional orchestras mm-hmm. are all over. So starting in my junior year, I played with the uh, Fox Valley Symphony Orchestra in Appleton driving up. I, I subbed at the Green Bay Symphony. I ended up playing in the La Crosse, Wisconsin Symphony, going down to Janesville Beloit. And I had these orchestral experiences with these groups that were very good. You know, Mm -hmm. many of the players were freelancers from the whole Madison, Milwaukee, Chicago area. A lot of them were teaching at the college level, just 
great music making. Um, I was really lucky that to have those opportunities as a sort of supplement to what I was doing in school, just to learn repertoire. And the thing I love the most about those, those gigs was that, you know, it was like a professional orchestra schedule where you'd start rehearsal on Tuesday, Tuesday night, you know, you'd rehearse for three days and then you'd give a concert that weekend. Mm -hmm. And the first time I was preparing for one of those concerts, I was just like, this is so cool. I'm so, I'm, I'm so nervous, but this is really, really cool. Like I I was Mm -hmm. so excited to have that sort of level of personal (laughs) accountability put onto my shoulders and to just see how I was, I was going to stack up. And it's nice to get paid too for all that work you've yeah, done. And it, yeah, yeah. You know, that's the that's one of the most fun mm-hmm. things about you know when students get their first gig and they're so excited. Whatever amount it is, it could be mm-hmm. you know mm-hmm. peanuts or it could be well paying. It's like they're so excited about it, and it's I mean it, it that's that's the moment when it's like okay, all those hours in the practice room, all those hours yeah. of listening and score study, and you know all of that stuff, you get to put it all towards that thing that you want to do. Yeah, yeah. It was just great. So, yeah. So I, I I started taking auditions then. I just and I never stopped until I <laughs> ended up where I am now. You know, and I was one of those people who was um, pretty pretty obsessive as far as always. You know, finding okay, what's what's going on in the next three months as far as, as, far as auditions, mm-hmm. getting my resume sent out and every, everything. And I, I think by the time I won my job in the Philharmonic, um, I had taken about twenty one or twenty two mm-hmm. professional full time auditions and of course right. countless regional orchestras summer fellowships all those are you know new world everything you can imagine i just i went for everything mm-hmm. <laughs> well okay so i have a i have a two part question um so the first part is i imagine that you know as you took more and more auditions and you kind of figured out well, okay this is my process this seems to be what's working what's getting me past the first round or advancing to the finals you you probably you know by the time you took that philharmonic audition you probably like okay this is my plan and this is exactly what I do do you feel comfortable sharing any aspects of that like how you arrived at oh, sure. your audition preparation method yeah yeah well, the, the number one thing for me in any audition that I ever did well at was wanting it really badly. Mm-hmm. Um, there, I've taken a lot of auditions where it was like, okay, I'm going to do this, but maybe it, I wasn't, uh, I could tell when I wasn't really fully invested in, in the process for, w- mm-hmm. for whatever reason, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, but the auditions where I did well, I really... I really wanted that job, uh-huh. um, and 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 that just made a big difference in in terms of how it sort of steered my my steps, the steps that I would I would take in in preparation. Um, but maybe in a, in a more practical sense, um, I am I have some aspects of my life that are very organized and some that aren't. But auditioning was one of them where I loved the organizational aspect of it and the sort of ritual of getting the excerpts together. It used to mm-hmm. be that, you know, before IMSLP and all this, you know, I had my Thompson edition. I literally took my Thompson edition with me to summer festivals. Like I would save room in my luggage to be able to carry two volumes of the Thompson mm-hmm. edition end up being because I would supplement whenever I got an orchestra part and I would make a photocopy of it, yep. add it to my collection. <laughs> yep. This is little, this is, you know, this is an insight into my brain, but, um, you know, but putting together that book and later putting together, you know, PDFs and everything, getting organized, getting all the materials in one place and having it sort of there in, in front of you, um, was such a huge part to my preparation alongside that preparing playlists. And there was one summer where I got really into editing recording so I would just have a 10 second introduction and and you know having the excerpt as a clip I would just listen to those playlists on repeat just getting used to sort of throwing myself into the orchestral texture of the whole context of what went along with with the excerpts um Mm -hmm. and I think without that aspect of without sort of the heavy listening and really digesting the excerpts in a tactile sense, seeing it on the page, putting together the book, you know, um, just 
kind of involving all all sort of sensory avenues in terms of uh, internalizing the music was so important. Um, the auditions I did well at, I, I also definitely spent time score studying. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> that's a huge part of what I still do. Actually, I'm a I'm I'm an obsessive score studier. I <laughs> I love it. <laughs> it's what I do when I'm commuting from New Jersey into New York City on the train. Mm -hmm. Is I have scores on my iPad and I'm always uh, always studying what pieces are coming up in the next couple of weeks. Um, but as far as the practicing, I regret to say that, like for my job, I didn't I didn't play for people as much as I wish I had. Um, uh, that I had done in, in various phases. Um, I also have a really hard time recording myself, but I've, I've largely gotten over that hump. But, you know, I, I wish I, I, I would have I would have done more of that. But um, a lot had to do with sort of keeping track of, of where everything was, too. And I like to sort of keep a spreadsheet in the weeks leading up to an audition mm. um, with every excerpt listed. And to kind of keep track of which ones might be neglected. You know, you get a check mark for the ones that you practice that day and to make sure that you're sort of covering all your bases with, with everything. Um, and um, I also, I just write a lot in my music too. Mm -hmm. So making sure that the breaths are planned, that the tempos are planned, that every sort of element of, of what you would like to show in the music is, is going to end up there for maybe for some people you don't need to kind of be so ob obsessively notational <laughs> as I am but it was part of my process as far as making sure that every excerpt had a point um, that I was clued into the emotional intent of the excerpt that I was clued into showing the major technical elements um, kind of decoding why are why is the committee asking this excerpt you know that it's not just because well sometimes it is just because it's on a top 10 list you know but <laughs> but i mean there's a there's a there's a there's a purpose there's something to be demonstrated here um and there's also a reason why we have a lot of different composers on you know audition lists and mm -hmm. sort of making sure that i was able to highlight the differences musically um and stylistically between between all the excerpts um so that's that's maybe less of a method and more of a sort of overarching just <laughs> value that's, system about approaching that's auditions. great advice but yeah, yeah yeah that's that's excellent advice mm -hmm. and then so i guess the second part of that question is you know you mentioned you took 20 some auditions mm -hmm. and maybe you didn't win every single one maybe some went better than others so how did you how did you deal with disappointment how did you deal with maybe getting really close making it to finals and then it just didn't didn't work out. How do you pick yourself back up from that emotionally after you put in all that effort and like mm -hmm. just get ready for the next one? Yeah. Um, <laughs> well, a lot of times when, when things didn't go well, I knew exactly what had happened. <laughs> and <laughs> I had very, I had, I've had very few um, maybe experiences in my audition history where I thought something went really well and I had sort of expectations for something that, and they didn't, and then, you know, didn't go that way or something. I feel like I had a pretty realistic sense for for when things had sort of gone the right way and when they hadn't. And I mean, gosh, I hate to say it, but whatever thing when things didn't go like kind of the right way, I I I, I really felt like it was my fault. <laughs> you know, not in a not in a self critical way, but uh -huh. I was it was well it it, it was self critical, but not sort of you know. Um, uh, demoralizing in a sense. Right. I was like, well, you know, quite honestly, this this needed to be better, and this quite didn't quite happen, and everything, you know. So, it w gave me fuel for the next one. Um, mm -hmm. I I sometimes did well in an audition, coming right off the back of something that had been a little bit disappointing, where okay. you know my preparation hadn't been the greatest, and um, you know, I remember um, I actually auditioned for the Philharmonic four times um, over the course of. <laughs> Um, before getting the job, so uh -huh. the fourth audition was was the one for me where I where I won the position. But I remember kind of coming off. Maybe it was the second time mm -hmm. I auditioned for the New York Philharmonic, and I just hadn't prepared well. You know, I hadn't really been all in in the way that I needed to, and I was upset with myself and, and not at the process necessarily. So I had three weeks before the next audition, so I kind of buckled down and made up for all the the sort of um, 
lack of <laughs> lack of motivation and, and, and lack of productivity that had been part of the, the first process and I was preparing for Kansas City Third Horn audition mm -hmm. and I ended up making the finals in that job. So I was like, well, you see, okay, it was like, that works. Of course, uh -huh. it was disappointing not to get the job, but it was also like, huh, if I just, okay, do, you know, let's try it again. Let's see what we're, just let's run the experiment again and change some of the variables and, right. you know, make sure that all the pieces are in place. Um, I would just get sort of really, um, just hungry for the next one when when one, even when one kind of came close and 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 I didn't quite get it I I felt I don't know if it was misplaced confidence but I was like I think I'm gonna get there eventually and and when I won my job I think I was maybe lucky and I felt like I had not kind of exhausted my options for mm -hmm. how to keep honing the process so um, but I had a lot of patience to for the process, which, which is very, which is very lucky. I mean, it, it's, but the, you know, kind of professional discouragement is, is going to be a part of all our lives and certainly school auditions. And mm -hmm. there's so many avenues where we're going to experience that, you know, and, and not getting into that summer program you wanted and, or not getting the, 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 the position you wanted, you know, whether it's a teaching job or a playing job and that sort of thing. Um, but I remember, you know, I think Doug always used to tell us, Doug Hill o mm -hmm. always used to say that it's important to remember that w when those things happen, it's it's not necessarily um, that what what you're selling isn't good. It's they're not buying what you're selling. That um, is so true. And sort of yeah. kind of, yeah. So yeah. I, I think I really internalized that and, and um, it was like, gosh darn it, I'll, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to find the right market for the, <laughs> for right. what I'm selling. And, and I'm going to, yeah, I'm going to kind of make, make sure that the product I am offering is, is the best it can possibly be. And, and, and when it's not, that's on me. <laughs> and, well, and it makes it less process. personal too. I mean, it's, it's, mm -hmm. it's not a rejection of you as like a human being. I mean, although it can certainly yes, feel yeah, that way, it yeah. can certainly feel that mm -hmm. way sometimes, <laughs> you know, and I think, I, you know, you try to prepare students. It's like you're going to meet with a lot of, quote, failures before you get, quote, success <laughs> just mm -hmm. because. Mm -hmm. But if you see every one of those experiences as moving you forward, moving yourself towards that that goal that you're going for, I think it's it's just a much more mm -hmm. positive way. Yeah, I think if you were to, um, you know, look at a list of, of everybody's sort of quote unquote failures or, right, yeah. you know, I mean, all the, all the things, all the jobs that every professional musician didn't get. I mean, obviously, you know, you've got, it, it's like 10 to one, <laughs> right? Oh, yeah, and I, yeah. I think I just, I just sort of accepted that. And, and that's a reason I was willing to take so many auditions. And because I, I think I knew that it was like, you were going to have to throw a lot at the wall and see what stuck. Mm -hmm. that, that's just kind of how this business works is and that's what I tell my students now too no matter if they're if they're doing if they're taking auditions or if they're uh, applying for teaching jobs it's like you you have to kind of give yourself more than one option <laughs> for the yeah. for the path forward um, yeah yeah so. hundred percent and I, mm -hmm. I realized I skipped a step in there we went straight from like University of Wisconsin to New York mm -hmm. Philharmonic but I do you want to share a little bit about your oh, graduate sure. school experience at Yale and yeah. studying with Bill Purvis right so yeah after Wisconsin I, I went on to Yale and got my master's degree with with Bill Purvis um, I had a I had a great time there I am so lucky in the three teachers that I had I just think that um, the way that they all taught and and what I got through sort of each step, the first being middle school and high school and then college with, with Doug Hill and then um, grad school was so complimentary in a way. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, from my first teacher, Julie, it just got such a great foundational beginning and just a toolkit mm -hmm. of, of how to sort of do the craft of this. So here <laughs> trying right. to do. So I came to college sort of ready to absorb all of Doug's incredible creativity based teaching style where it was kind of like go out there and, and figure out what you want to do. You know, and mm -hmm. I remember the first lesson with him was always a packet of ideas. Yep. <laughs> like yep. here's, you know, here, here are etudes and exercises and pieces and things that cover all the techniques and, and many of the angles that you can explore as a horn player, like dive in, you're going to have to, you have to sort of pick some paths. And, mm -hmm. um, and, and that was, that was just an incredible w way to learn is 
the the most important thing was to sort of um, do what you love <laughs> and to learn mm -hmm. to love to love what you do in a way with Doug. And then I went to um, grad school at Yale and, and studied with with Bill Purvis. Um, and I feel like I there I really learned how to actually practice and how to take the, the the most maybe significant steps toward independence mm -hmm. that we all all need to learn as far as how are you going to stay your own teacher how mm -hmm. are you going to hold yourself accountable um you know what types of questions do you need to be asking yourself about the music you're studying and, and how are you going to make yourself better mm -hmm. basically <laughs> at some point um so um i had two great years at, at yale and it was while i was i was there that actually i i took my first audition for the philharmonic and ended mm -hmm. up advancing to a sort of um super semi-final as it mm -hmm. were um where we i played um duets on stage with with phil myers and ultimately was not offered a position but i started subbing with the orchestra uh, okay. um yeah. so in my in my second year of masters um i i started just i had two opportunities to to sub with the philharmonic um which were terrifying <laughs> was, i was it, i i and at that i called my i called my 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 high school teacher, Julie, and I said, oh my God, they asked me to come in and play assistant on, on Brooker 7 and complete Firebird. And oh my God, I'm, I'm so excited. But should I tell them that I've never played with a full-time professional orchestra before? <laughs> and she said, no, do not, you do not need to tell them that. Right, <laughs> She's right. like, you just prepare and you, you know, you show up and, and you do a great job, but no, you do not need to sort of qualify your, um, your, your right to be there, you know? Mm -hmm. And, um, so, um, um, so I continued, obviously, to take tons of auditions um, when I was at Yale. After I graduated with my master's degree, I moved to New York, and I did a program called Ensemble Connect. Mm -hmm. um, it's what it's known as now. It's a um, kind of a post postgraduate fellowship run by Carnegie Hall, uh -huh. um, yeah, it, which was uh, one great because it meant I was in New York, um, kind of being able to take advantage of some of the opportunities there. and. A lot of what that program was all about was more of a um, professional development and a platform to develop entrepreneurial skills in musicians and especially community engagement skills. So both educational and, and maybe um, beyond the education system, which um, taking a lot of conservatory and university trained musicians who didn't necessarily have an educational background or any practical training in that area and then um, giving us some tools and opportunities to do things like develop community concerts and go into schools and do a 45 minute assembly style interactive program for school kids of all ages. Um, mm -hmm. And that was really, really valuable. Um, just such a nice supplement as far as learning some good communication skills, uh, learning some good uh, flexibility <laughs> sure, skills yeah. yeah just ways that you could ways that you can talk to people through music either verbally mm -hmm. or through music so i'm grateful for that um at the end of at the end of the, my time in in the academy it was called the academy then now it's called mm -hmm. ensemble connect um i was actually uh I started sub subbing full time with the New York Philharmonic. There was uh -huh. a vacancy in the section. Um, I was on the list. I was available, and I ended up playing for just about a, a full season um, as a substitute musician with the orchestra. And at the end of that year, was was the audition where I I won my job. Um, yeah, I think I remember seeing you on one of the live at Lincoln Center. So I was like, oh yes. hey, that's mm -hmm. yeah, that's <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I probably looked very nervous, right? Yeah. <laughs> No, but you look. You look was, like you knew what you were doing. So. <laughs> Fake it till you make it is is the truest yeah. thing, right? Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Um, but I, I can't believe it. I mean, I, I'm I'm so lucky to have my job. I, I just I always wanted to be in orchestra. It didn't matter which orchestra. I just mm -hmm. I just wanted to do it. Um, and of course, uh, playing with the Philharmonic, I I fell in love with sound with <laughs> sure, um, yeah. the way the way the orchestra orchestra played it's just an unbelievable privilege to to have this job it's i i can't believe it i just pinch myself every day <laughs> <laughs> no that's that's really awesome mm -hmm. um so let's see i don't want to i don't want to run too far over time mm -hmm. I, I do want to talk about um 
uh, one other topic. But before we do that, just in kind of a nutshell, maybe talk a little bit about, okay, so you have, I'm assuming, a super busy schedule with the Philharmonic with concerts and rehearsals and things like that. So how do you balance that schedule with... Okay, just keeping yourself in playing shape and making sure your fundamentals are working. And then also, you know, being a human and having a life outside of just your job and your horn playing. That's something that um, takes practice, too, <laughs> I think. Um, and I found when I first started in the job, I had almost no bandwidth for anything else. Um, mm -hmm. Just kind of the process of getting tenure and, and getting used to just the breakneck pace of a professional orchestra was really all-consuming um, as a young musician. Um, but I figured it out within a couple seasons uh, mm -hmm. of doing that. Um, I started to have a life again <laughs> yeah. outside of the orchestra. Um, and I, um, I started teaching mm. uh, back in 2017, um, which is great. I'm on the horn faculty at Rutgers University in New Jersey and at New York University. So I have a handful of students um, in, in each school, um, which has been awesome. I really love teaching. I, I love it. Um, the positions at those schools are, are um, very adjunct. So mm -hmm. really my, my responsibility is just for sort of lessons, juries, recitals, mm -hmm. um, and a horn choir that horn studio class, things like that. Mm -hmm. um, so it's possible to have the orchestra schedule um, right. and, and do that. Um, my husband and I moved from the city to New Jersey just for sort of quality of life mm -hmm. <laughs> issues and, and just to kind of have a little bit of balance there um, in terms of, of city life. And, sure. and we have a home sort of that feels feels somewhat out in the country, um, even though it's, it's New Jersey. Um, that's been that's been good. Um, it's sort of a, um, yeah, it's, it, it is something I, I found, of course, as, as I, I, we all do and everybody, your teachers tell you this, you know, you'll have to figure out the work-life balance and yeah, yeah. It, it does take some, it does take some, some doing. Um, and I think just an important thing for me has been learning how to sort of uh, compartmentalize the job. I used to sort of take everything home with me. Mm -hmm. um, whether I was anxious about a specific part or just sort of a, a, a general sort of, oh, it's a big program this week and, <laughs> yeah. you know, um, learning just to sort of leave that at work and you're going to be fine even if you don't <laughs> drive yourself crazy worrying about it all afternoon, you know, between the, the dress rehearsal and the concert mm -hmm. um, and, and sort of being able to just turn your focus, whether it's it's, you know, going home to have lunch and walk the dog and, you know, mm -hmm. do normal things in the middle of the day or but whether it's going to um, teach a couple lessons before the concert. Um, that was something I, I really, really had to, to learn to do. Mm -hmm. um, and it gets easier with time. But yeah, it was, it, it is important. I think, um, obviously, you got to have interests outside of, <laughs> outside yeah, of uh, yeah. uh, the orchestra and, and the job. And, and, um, I, I ran the New York City Marathon twice, as sort of, oh my uh, yeah, which was great. Uh, um, nowadays, it kind of came in this this uh, this rare sort of moment of time where I had settled into the job enough where <laughs> I was uh -huh. feeling comfortable, but I didn't have the teaching obligations I do now. You know, it, it, right. it would just wouldn't be possible these days. But I had this sort of opportunity to invest some time in this, and something that that made me feel really great was kind of a bucket list item and sure. um, something that actually the running really helped my horn playing too it was great not even from a, a breathing sense but just in a I think it was sort of having a lower resting heart rate oh, when I was running a lot it made me okay. feel so centered and grounded on stage um, so that was sort of a, a side benefit to that so um, now now I have sort of an opposite hobby I, I um, bake a lot of uh, sourdough bread. <laughs> oh, <laughs> so I nice. changed from running to eating as, as my sort of outside hobby. But I, <laughs> I like that too. Um, every, you know, it's funny though. I, I feel like the things I get into outside of work are, they, they require practice as well, which is, I was going to say like baking is very much is like methodical a, and a plan yes. and yeah, I'm seeing a trend here. So <laughs> Yes, yeah. So there's something about that that sort of yeah, always, always being in a learning process, and mm -hmm. and um, I, I like I like things where you can you know learn more, where you can learn to mm -hmm. either. It's not even about getting better necessarily, right? It's just about kind of 
always learn, always learning new things is, it's really great. Um, yeah, it's very enriching. So. <laughs> well, that's, that's terrific. Yeah. And I mean, it, I think I was, you know, I have this on my little notes here, ask about mm -hmm. advice for music students today, but I think we just spent like the last 15 minutes doing that because everything mm -hmm. you've said is like gold for an aspiring musician and aspiring, you know, arts, you know, oriented kind of career is just to always keep learning and mm -hmm. just pick yourself up and be, you know, always, always just keep after it, whatever, whatever that it might be. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah. now I was also going to say you have, you have musical interests, but not necessarily specifically related to your job in the New York Philharmonic. Mm -hmm. You, you, mm -hmm. you've been a champion of music by women composers, which is something, um, I've, I've done a little bit of, maybe not as much mm -hmm. as you, but I, I, I've really gotten into playing music by underrepresented composers and trying to, mm -hmm. you know, make sure that music gets its fair due. So do you want to talk a little bit about your experiences with that? Absolutely. Yeah. And um, I have occasional opportunities to do recitals and solo performances. But a couple of years ago, um, I think the, the first time I did this was actually another classmate of ours, um, Gina Gilley, mm -hmm. hosted the uh, Northwest Horn Symposium um, back in 2017 and invited me to come give a recital. And I thought, you know what? I think I'm, I'm you know, I had found a pianist locally who was kind of enthusiastic about it, mm -hmm. too. And and we were working together on some repertoire. I said, I'm just going to try to program a whole program, a whole recital of, of women composers. And it was so easy to do. <laughs> like, I couldn't believe it. I, um, I know that you've written a bit about it. And I, I've, I've definitely read what you had um, to say as far as repertoire ideas, James. And of course, Lynn Folk's website uh -huh. is totally invaluable for that. Um, and I I was just shocked. Like, I was like, okay, I think it's going to be really hard to, to come up with a, a recital that I feel is something I can prepare and that represents a good breadth of, of repertoire. Um, but it was it was like, it, it was just not hard to do. So I thought, oh mm -hmm. my gosh, if I can do it, everybody can do this. <laughs> and mm -hmm. and um, so I've kind of just made a, made a point to do that. Whenever I have the opportunity to to play a solo or or do some sort of a recital, um, I, I sort of did the same program at the 2018 um, Horn Symposium in, in Muncie. Or am I, I might yeah, be wrong, yeah. the year there. Yeah, yeah I remember so that you played I, the Vigneri yeah, Sonata. Vigneri, Sonata. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I did, um, I did the Ruth Gipps Sonatina. Mm -hmm. And incidentally, both of those pieces, now I have my students do because mm -hmm. they're just they're great pieces of music they're so beautiful the Gips is like a perfect piece for definitely like an advancing university student because mm -hmm. it has a great piano part too it's it's just wonderful as far as learning about how to collaborate with your accompanist and it's three short movements that are musically just really really interesting um and and just fun to put together um, I think on that program too, I played uh, Sheila Silver's Dynamis, which is oh, an, one, one, one of those wonderfully thorny, unaccompanied pieces with okay. lots of extended techniques. Really fun, and, and that was something in grad school that Bill Purvis handed to me and said, "Here, you should try to learn this." And I thought, okay. oh, I can't. <laughs> but, <laughs> but it was one of those great like process pieces where you learn so much in in putting it together and. You know, it, and it kind of becomes a permanent part of your repertoire. I love, sure. I love diving into a, a challenge like that. Um, but um, it's, I, I just have, um, and I haven't even kind of gone into the, uh, gone the avenue of like commissioning works and, and things like that. You know, there's just so much out there once we start looking. Mm -hmm. um, and and so I think that's in in sort of programming like this. I really want to make that point where if if you have the desire to do it. Um, if you have the just kind of the gumption and you put the care into it, it's about taking taking care mm -hmm. to research and to to find what's out there. Um, there's a great, uh, I think it's Subito Music Corporation, yes, which is based yeah. in New Jersey, but they have that in the imprint called Seesaw um, within that, and it's a lot of women, or a lot of women composers, a lot of underrepresented composers, mm -hmm. and you know I've ordered a lot of music from them and just had the the joy of like playing through a bunch of new pieces and looking for recital rep. Um, yeah, I, I discovered a new one lately by Annette Lesage called Shadow Dancer, an yes, unaccompanied yeah, piece. Yeah. Great piece, you know, and and just so much so suitable for for any sort of recital. Um, and it's just those 
moments of discovering what's out there. And, and it, it, I find it so inspiring. Um, and I've always loved sort of programming recitals and I, I like that part of it too, but, and to really just make a point of, of, um, showcasing women's voices is, is mm-hmm. become just very, very important. So, right. yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. When well, I imagine that's a nice balance between, and, you know, having spoken with other full-time orchestral players, they talk about, look, okay, you know, that's your day job and you love it and you're hundred percent dedicated to it, but it's nice to be able to make your own decisions about repertoire from time to time. It's nice mm-hmm. to be able to mm-hmm. decide, I want to go this tempo and not, <laughs> not the <laughs> tempo that, you know, is, is kind of, what exactly. someone, the decision someone else yeah. is making for for you. So it's, I mean, right. you kind of have to have both sides of that coin, I think, to be, yeah. you know, yeah. and, and for some, I know, I'll never forget this quote Dave Jolly said, he said, like, chamber music will feed your musical soul. And mm-hmm. I think mm-hmm. it doesn't have to be chamber music. It can be whatever mm-hmm. it is, whatever you're you're doing. You just have to keep, keep yourself engaged. Um, yeah. Because I think, oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, it's also, it's really challenging to put together a recital once you're not in that mode anymore. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so once you've kind of gotten comfortable, you know, being comfortably ensconced as I am in, in you know, third horn in a horn <laughs> section in the back of the orchestra, then all of a sudden you have to go up and stand with just, just you in a piano or, or just you or, or in a chamber music group. It's, it's really uh, maybe a healthy challenge to mm-hmm. think of performance in, in those terms as well. And endurance wise, it's great it, for a lot of, you know, I mean, mm-hmm. so many reasons why it's, it's great, but I think it's, um, yeah, it's definitely not easy, which is maybe why it's so much fun to do. But. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know that, I know that yeah. recital you did mm-hmm. at the IHS was really mm-hmm. impressive. And, you know, I thought Leelani, maybe kind of to wrap up, I mean, we, I could, we could talk for a lot longer, but yeah. I mean, mm-hmm. I, I think a good way to maybe wrap up our conversation today might be to talk about your involvement with the IHS and mm-hmm. maybe a word of encouragement for anybody out there, horn players, to find out about the IHS and maybe get involved. Yeah. Um, well, I remember uh, at the University of Wisconsin, outside of Doug Hill's horn studio, where he kept, you know, he had a big bulletin board and all mm-hmm. these postings about everything going on. I remember he had like a note card or something that said all serious horn players join the international horn society and join was underlined. And, and it was kind of this, this idea that, you know, if you, if this is what you want, you know, like get involved. (laughs) And my involvement has really just been to sort of go to conferences to, to, to play at some, um, I, you know, I've, I haven't gotten involved in, in the whole organizational aspect of it. And I have a ton of respect for everybody who does, because I know how much time it takes, how much of your own personal time, but to, to contribute to this organization that is about bringing people together. Um, Mm -hmm. I've loved every conference that I've gone to. It's just the like-minded people. It is so much fun to meet new people and to have this thing in common. I'm not even a people person, but (laughs) At a horn symposium, yeah, for sure, I'm a people person, you know, because everybody has this this thing that unites us, and the spirit of it is so genuine. Um, you know, I love getting the horn call. I never finish every article, you know, every every issue, just like I, I never finish my New Yorkers, but then they, they sit and pile up. But I love everything that you read. You just get so much out of it. Um, um, there's such a just a wealth of, of knowledge there. But, you know, I took – Doug's little message to heart, and I think I joined as soon as I was I was out of school or out out of college, maybe, and mm-hmm. um, I joined in, in grad school. Um, I you know I wish I could go to Montreal this summer for IHS fifty five. I'm not going, but I have a student who's going, and I'm oh, gonna that's live great. Yeah. vicariously through her. She's gonna she's gonna present some of her DMA, uh, her dissertation research. And, oh, that's uh, really cool. And present, yeah. and I just I I just said, oh my gosh, you're gonna love it. Yeah, <laughs> that's what I told yeah. her. I know she will. So, um, yeah, just that just the sort of um, and and I love that. I feel like the Horn Society has remained a very friendly and accessible um, type of, of community too. Like mm-hmm. when you go to a Horn conference, you can talk to everyone, you know, right. <laughs> there's, there's, right. there's, there's nobody kind of so big that, that they're sort of, um, they, they sort of exist on another plane. We're all there together. <laughs> and, and I think, yeah. I think that's, 
it's just so much fun. And then, of course, getting to see people who you, know, you went to school with or went to did yep. that with. And, and it's like a big yeah, family. Everybody reunion. loves that stuff. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So, yeah, I think for younger for younger players, especially who are not sure maybe what the what what sort of uh, horn society membership <laughs> would mean. I mean, it is just a way to to be connected and mm-hmm. to be sort of plugged into like the good work that's that's being done. Um, in the world of horn and, and, um, I, I loved what I think, um, I listened to your, the, the episode with, with Doug Hill, of course. Oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and when he was saying sort of about kind of, kind of maybe bridging the gap to be between the sort of strictly performing disciplines and the academic disciplines and, mm-hmm. and sort of, um, it, it really sort of elevates both. And I think puts, puts both sides of what we do into conversation, you know, and, and there's just so much to be learned from every angle. Of it. So, yeah. <laughs> That's great. Thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah.